Hi, I'm Lita Leepin. And I'm Jim Gordon. And welcome to another edition of Our City Tonight. Well, uh, folks, Lita, we've been on the air uh, over 10 years, but we are at a place we've never filmed at before, and that is the world-class uh, Fairmont Pacific Rim, and specifically their second-floor restaurant, The Botanist. Yes, and uh, Chef Hector Luna's menu depicts culinary abundance and botany of the Pacific Northwest region. Yeah, boy, I got to tell you, you and I have been here many times. It's a great place to eat and located right in the heart of Vancouver, botanist is. Hey, but they also have great wine, which is why we're here, and that is coming up next. This wine moment is brought to you by Gergich Hills Estate, a family-owned, regenerative, organic certified winery, committed to making wines of the highest quality and consistency. Well, we're still here at Botanist, but I'm now joined by Maya Jeremaz. She is the daughter of Evo and the great grandniece of the founder of Gergich Wineries, Hills Estate actually. I am so excited about this because it is essentially kind of a Croatian wine and you're gonna tell us all about the very rich history behind this incredible winery. Yeah, we have a really fantastic history. As you mentioned, uh, we have Croatian origins. So uh, my great, great uncle, Mike Gergic, he was born in Croatia in 1923 to a huge family, uh, 11 kids. So oh. growing up in Croatia back in the 20s, very, he was from a very poor family. It wasn't the best place in the world to grow up back then. And so he grew up making wine with his father. So he actually started drinking wine when he was about two years old. <laughs> and he lived to 100, so ah, say what you will about that. Good recipe. <laughs> yes. And, um, but he always had dreams to leave Croatia and start a winery. He knew he couldn't do that uh, in his home country. So in 1954, he left and he went to Germany and then he actually came to Vancouver uh, and lived here for two years. Uh, and finally in 1958, he uh, got a visa to come to the United States. Uh, and eventually he ended up working for a winery called Chateau Antelena. And when he was there, he made a 1973 Chardonnay that was entered into a competition called the Paris Tasting. That, the very famous tastings of many, well, all the wine people of the world definitely know the stories. Please tell this, this is very famous. Yeah, so it was a, a tasting that was put on by a British man named Stephen Spurrier. He had come to California and taken a bunch of uh, California wines back to Paris. And he put on this tasting where they had all French judges. It was a blind tasting, American versus French. And they picked the 1973 Chateau Montalena Chardonnay as the best white wine, and then a Stag's Leap Cabernet as the best red wine. So two American wines uh, beat out all the French wines, wow. which was a shock for the wine world. <laughs> Controversy. Controversial, um, but it was fantastic for Napa because it showed we could make great wine. And all of a sudden people started coming to Napa um, to start wineries and make Napa what it is today. Gergich wines also attain regenerative um, organic certification. Yeah. Please describe what that is to our viewers and to myself as well. Yeah, so it was always, um, when Mike was growing up in Croatia, you know, it wasn't called organic farming or anything like that. It was just called farming. Um, and so we've always done organic farming. Um, we became an estate winery in 2003. Mm -hmm. So that means we stopped buying grapes. We own all of our own vineyards. Wonderful. And um, right nowadays, uh, my father, Ivo, is our winemaker and he often calls himself a farmer, not a winemaker. <laughs> and so in 2019, he discovered regenerative farming and it took him four years to get certified. But really what that means, it's an even higher level of farming than organic. Oh. Uh, so basically it means, first of all, you have to take care of your soil. You're not allowed to till your soil. Um, it disturbs the microbial habitat and you, for the best possible wine and farming, uh, you don't want to disturb soil. The second part of it is that you have to use animals, which is, it's just going back to basics, back to the natural way of doing things. We're not trying to be some geniuses that uh, pretend to know everything. We're just going back to natural farming. So we uh, unleash a flock of sheep into our vineyards every year, and they go through the rows and eat the cover crop and then do their business, which <laughs> is very healthy for the, uh, for the soil. 
And then the third part is you have to treat your employees well, which that is should just be common, but unfortunately it's not. So really those three things, if you do all those, then you can be certified. So we're one of about 14 maybe wineries wow. in the world that has that certification. So it, it's something we're very proud of. Wonderful. Well, let's jump right into the two wines that we have in front of us, uh, very special. Uh, can you tell us first maybe about the Chardonnay? Yeah. So our Chardonnay is our flagship wine. Given our history, that's not surprising. Um, and our Chardonnay and all of our wines have always been made more of a, a European style, just given where our family's from. It's the style that we prefer and we drink a lot of our own wines. So um, the Chardonnay is fruit forward, it's crisp, it's acidic. It comes from our southern vineyards in Napa Valley, which are a lot cooler. Um, so we don't, we uh, only do a little bit of malolactic fermentation to keep it nice and light and very food friendly. And it's aged in French oak, not American oak. And that's a, um, that's, it serves a purpose because French oak is a little bit more subtle. And my dad always says uh, the oak should be like a cradle for a newborn baby. And for us, the French oak is the correct cradle. Wonderful, that is delicious. Okay, let's uh, finish up with the beautiful red that we have. Yeah, and then Cabernet, is, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is our most popular red. And it's made, again, in more of a European style, more Bordeaux style. There's some tea for dough in it, some Merlot, and some Cabernet Franc. The blend changes every year, but it's more of a restrained Cabernet. Since we're at Botanist, what would you pair on the menu with this beautiful wine? Yeah, so for the, uh, for the Chardonnay, I would say the butter poached halibut would be Ooh. fantastic. You know, a little bit of the acidity to uh, counteract the butter. Mm, so delicious. Like and the red. I think here at the Botanist, I would pair it with the dry aged strip loin. Um, otherwise, it's great with pasta with heartier sauces. Uh, Croatians are big on lamb. So anything that's a little bit uh, more robust. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for sharing these beautiful wines with us. We will definitely get you back to talk a little bit more about the whole creation history. And uh, so we have Maya Jeremaz uh, with Gergic Hills Estate Winery. And thanks to the uh, people here at Botanist for hosting us. This wine moment was brought to you by Gergic Hills Estate, a family owned regenerative organic certified winery committed to making wines of the highest quality and consistency. Well, of course, doing a segment on Arts Umbrella and specifically Splash would not be a segment without this man to my uh, left, your right. It's Paul Araki, who's the uh, CEO of Arts Umbrella. Paul, every autumn, we're here with you and I'm glad to be back again with you this year. Welcome back. Thank you so much for putting a spotlight on this important fundraiser for Arts Umbrella. This is such a great story and we've been covering this for, I think, six of the last seven years, 2020 being the exception for obvious reasons. But uh, this is something we're doing for the second year. We did this last year for the first time. And this is really about kind of a preview of the big arts splash gala that's coming up. But let's talk about what we're doing here this evening. Well, tonight is the annual um, artist celebration for Splash. It's once again this year, generously sponsored by the Audain Foundation. And it's an opportunity for us to thank, in this year, it's 90 artists from Vancouver and across the country nice. who have generously donated major artworks to this charitable art auction for Arts Umbrella. And this is a chance for us to acknowledge their uh, unprecedented support and to throw a party for them. <laughs> and this is great because as we're filming this, the, the Big Splash Gala is about, a, about two weeks from now. Yes. And that is a really great evening, which you, if you're a viewer of our show, you've seen us cover. But uh, this is such a great thing too, what you guys do, because it's all about the kids. And we have talked about that over the years, but let's remind our viewers again about where all this money raised is going to and the great history you have with Arts Umbrella. Well, Splash is 42 years old and throughout all of those years, the efforts behind raising funds for Arts Umbrella are really about making high quality arts education available to children and youth across our communities. And, you know, just looking at this coming year, we will serve more than 20,000 young people 
with approximately 80% accessing our programs at no cost due to the generosity of supporters like the artists and sponsors involved with Splash. And there's so many generations. We were filming at uh, your, your building on Granville Island uh, a little while ago, and there's a, a young woman coming by with her toddler, and she was a toddler when she first came, yeah. and it just carries on through generations. Yeah, and we have that next generation happening within our own committees, within our sponsor base, certainly within the families who come to Arts Umbrella to see that story continue about the important role that an arts education can make in the lives of young people, all young people, it's critical. It is. Um, we should mention too, for our regular viewers, they know that every episode we air airs twice. So our, the first airing for this segment, of course, will be on uh, our, on September 29th. That's a week before the gala. So if you're watching the second airing, which is on October 6th, that's the night or the day after the big uh, Splash Gala. For people who are seeing the second airing or are not going to the Splash Gala, let's talk about what they can do uh, to help the kids. Well, following Splash this year, October 5th, presented by Nicola Wealth, there are so many opportunities for young people and families and philanthropists in our community to, to really support the mission of Arts Umbrella. And I would encourage people to go to our website, which is www.artsumbrella.com. It's beautiful, Paul Rock. Good guy, folks. Uh, check them out, Arts Umbrella. And uh, you mentioned the artists. Lita's talking to a couple of them. Lita, we'll hand things over to you. Well, thanks, Jim, and I am very fortunate to be here with one of the esteemed artists that has donated a gorgeous piece to the Splash Auction. Uh, I'm with Jolinda Linden, and wow, I am just totally drooling over this piece. Tell us all about this donation piece. Thank you. So this year, my piece for Splash is a bronze garden. Last year, it was all white, and this year, I wanted to venture into a richer color in the bronze. And my work starts with porcelain, and each individual form is hand-shaped with my hands, and then it goes through the kiln multiple times. I use things like glass and high temperatures and long uh, firing times to create a metamorphic look in each individual cup for a composition that comes together that looks like a garden, very organic and soft. And when you do see color in my work, it is a chemical reaction that's happening at 2000 degrees. For example, these pieces have glass that becomes molten at the 2000 degrees and it will bubble up against the bronze glazes and pull out colors that, uh, and create the blues and the violets that you'll see if you step close to the piece. And how has your arts education affected your life, your career? So interestingly, I'm, I, my background is science and so I use that a lot in my studio. I'm working with uh, uh, um, uh, chemical elements and temperature and time. And so, but I did, my parents did put me in classes when I was young, similar to Arts Umbrella. And I've been working with ceramics since I was probably five years old. I have my original piece that I made when I was five in my studio. Wow. And it's just always been a thread throughout my life. Even when I wasn't working as a professional artist, I was always working in the arts. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, now I'm with the second artist that we get to meet and interview, Zoe Pollock. Uh, welcome to our city tonight and uh, congratulations on this beautiful piece that you've donated tonight. We want to know all about it. Thank you so much. Um, this is a vessel painting. I've been painting full time for 18 years and this is the most recent body of work. This piece is representing a vessel which is an upside down U shape. It's a vase, a glass, a bowl, a holding space representing the body. Tell us um, your medium. I am an oil painter. I've been painting in the oil for 18 years. Wow, okay. And so um, a little bit about uh, your arts education, how it's, I know you're born and raised in Vancouver. Tell us a little bit about uh, how you got into the arts. I was born and raised in White Rock, but I did high school at Langley Fine Arts, and so I had the advantage of getting to specialize in fine arts in high school, grades 10, 11, 12. 
And then I was fortunate enough to get to go to school in Montreal for two years, Halifax and Mexico. So I studied high realism and a very traditional style and have now departed into abstraction. Beautiful. And uh, so um, how did you get involved with Splash Auction? I've been involved with Splash since the second that they asked me to be a part of it. Uh, it's been a number of years and it's such a, it's truly an honor when you're an artist in this city to be invited to be a part of this show is a big deal. It really is and that is um, shown with the sold out event that is on October 5th. And so congratulations, oh, your work is beautiful. I did take a peek online. Thank you. And so uh, people can uh, bid on this beautiful art. Uh, check out the website for sure. Thank you. Well, back here at uh, one of our favorite spots, the Parker Rooftop. Come check this great place out. It's at the corner of Howe and Pacific. Our next guest is an award-winning, international award-winning director. She's a producer. She's a writer. Her latest film is a movie that I really enjoyed, and we wanted to have her on because it's now streaming uh, worldwide on PBS. The movie is called Born to Lead, the Sal Onisi story. And joining us now is its director, uh, Laura Slife. Laura, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. You are quite welcome, and thank you for this film. Uh, you know, I have to tell you, uh, I knew of this young man, uh, and right off the bat at the beginning of your film, you have a quote which I think more than anything else sums up who this man was. And it's from John Quincy Adams that says, if your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more, to do more, and to become more, you are a leader. I think that sums up this young man. Tell our viewers who may not know the life of Solonisi. Well, um, Salonisi was one of the first uh, Samoans um, to take a down and out team at the University of Colorado to a national championship, only not necessarily the way you may think because he gets stomach cancer and the team rallies around him, him and his spirit and ends up um, uh, being able to lead in every way. Uh, in person, uh, before he got cancer, and then after he got cancer, and, and when he passed away. Um, but it is a, a really inspirational story. Um, it's one of the greatest stories I've ever heard about, and that's why I ended up having to do it because yeah. it was so amazing. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 this, this, this young man is, it's, it's literally like if you're creating this, this young man out of central casting because it's, he comes up a blue collar, uh, loving family. Uh, he's a star as a quarterback and back then he's also acting as a running back, as it's great to see. But he just gets the scholarship and he chooses to go to Colorado, as you said, because it's a struggling school and he wants to build something, which, as I said, he just seemed to have leadership pouring out of his skin at a very young age. Yes, from nine and 10 uh, years old, he knew exactly where he wanted to go. He had um, leadership abilities. And when the kids were, you know, out eating Pop Tarts and, you know, playing crazy games outside, he was, you know, he was working out at nine and 10 doing push ups and sit ups. So he uh, absolutely knew that he wanted to, uh, that he was going to go somewhere and that he wanted to, um, you know, lead uh, a team. He really wanted to build a team. That's what he wanted to do. Yeah, and it's interesting. Uh, many of us aspire to be like that, but uh, he just, as I said, lived and eat, ate it and, and breathed it. And when he's at the university, one thing I didn't know about him, and, and you can tell us more about this, there's, a, I thought, a turning point when he's arrested. I mean, he's an all-star. He's the all-American kid, but he's arrested. And that seems to be a moment of contemplation where it's like, I have to be a bigger person, even though he's near perfect uh, at that point. Yes, and the coach also expressed um, expressed that same uh, thing. He basically said, you know, listen, you've got a team to lead. You have to be better. You have to be bigger than than this. Uh, even though it might be racially motivated, um, you need to stand apart and um, do the right thing. So. He, he definitely learned from this, even though, you know, there were some things where he really shouldn't, he really didn't do anything. You know, he went and he pulled down a poster in a kid's room, but um, it really, <laughs> he shouldn't have gone to jail for it. But so, you know, that's where we were then, I guess. It made, it made the team like very uh, cohesive. 
Yeah, and, and you see uh, the guests, the interviews you have on in this film, and again, as I said, they're older men now, but they still, the reverence that they have for, for Sal is, is, is so remarkable that he led in so many different ways that, Lara, I have to say, I love sports movies, uh, inspirational films like this get made because people do love them, and this is no exception. Uh, I want to congratulate you, and I, I want to mention to George Antipol uh, did I get last Antipopolis. Did I get that last name or close? Antonopolis. Antonopolis. Thank you. Uh, you two have put together a superb film. I want to remind everybody again: streaming uh, worldwide on PBS now. More information: borntolead.com. And congratulations to uh, Living. LargeProductions.com, that's your company. And Laura, thank you very much for joining us to talk thank about you very this much. Go to film. BornToLeadFilm.com yes. for more information. Thanks so much. Thank you, Laura. This Canadian artist hit a billion streams with her first single. You remember this one? That was the 2014 release of Hideaway, which put this singer-songwriter on the map. She is here today to talk about her new single, her new album, and a tour that will in fact bring her to Vancouver on October 7th. Our city tonight is thrilled to welcome first time to our show, Kaiza. You are in LA, but you also live part-time in Toronto, true Canadian through and through, and you're from Calgary. Yes, born and raised in Calgary, and then I have a home in Toronto, and then I basically am in a little treehouse studio in LA, because <laughs> I am a nature bug. I basically, I need to be in the trees as much as possible. So um, it's where I've been writing a lot of the latest music, um, and just escaping to the wilderness, basically. Now, I first fell in love with your music, of course, a decade ago, and, um, mm. but, how have you changed over this last 10 years as a singer-songwriter? I've changed dramatically. A lot of it had to do with the car crash that I went through and the seven-year recovery that followed that. Um, that just put me a lot deeper into myself because of the amount of time I spent alone recovering from a brain injury. And, and overcoming that can, reconnected me with a side of myself that was actually the beginning of my music. Um, which was playing on the guitar and playing with the ukulele and or, more organic sounds and a lot deeper lyrics. And I decided that I wanted to bring both of those sides back together now that I was returning to dance music. And um, just see how, how adding some more depth to the dance, dance floor would resonate with people because I felt like for me, coming back to dance is very therapeutic because I haven't been able to do it for so many years. But prior to being injured, I would go to the dance floor to heal. And I realized going through a recovery that dancing and crying are very similar in a, in a healing way. They really connect you to an honest side of yourself where you're expressing yourself physically and emotionally in a very honest way. So when you get out of a good dance or out of a good cry, you feel reset in a similar way. And that's why my album's called Dancing and Crying. It's because of the journey back to dance music. Well, your, your music has been described as a cross of dance, house, high energy, electro pop, with house influences as well as folk influences. Yeah. We're dying to know, and you can share with our viewers, what were you listening to as a young ballerina, as a dancer? Um, what were you listening to to inspire you as a youngster? I was brought up on a lot of ABBA because <laughs> my, my dad is Scandinavian genetic, so <laughs> I, I was literally force fed ABBA by my dad and force fed Michael Jackson by my mom. And then um, I actually grew up on a lot of theater music. My dad would play um, a lot of Andrew Lloyd Webber on the piano. And then I grew up on folk musicians like Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell, who um, was born and raised very close to where I was from. She's near, from very close to Calgary. So she was a, a hero of mine growing up and Cat Stevens. Um, you know, I, I got the influence for the dance music and all the diva singers from my mom because she was obsessed with people like Barbara Streisand and the big vocalists like, like uh, Etta James and, you know, anyone with a giant voice. Um, she, my mom had that influence on me and, um, and then we would sing along together. So I really think that singing along to music with my mom is, is why I developed my voice so strongly um, from an early age. 
Now, how can people find out a little bit more about you, uh, your website? Where can they go to find out more about the tour? Well, if they can remember how to spell my name, <laughs> you can just Google it and find everything. It's K-I-E-S-Z-A, or Z if you're in the United States. Um, and, and literally, I'm a one-name wonder, so you can put that into anything. Um, Instagram, YouTube, my webpage okay. is kaiza.com. You can find my tour. I'm, uh, it's a it's very special year because I haven't had a headline tour in seven years since the car crash. Um, I just couldn't handle all the lights and the loud music and the crowds. And this is my return to touring, which is literally what I feel my soul was meant to do on this planet, was to perform for people. So. It's a huge stepping stone for me in my recovery, but also just my fans as well reconnecting. So we're having the Dancing and Crying Tour in October, starting in Vancouver on the 7th, and we're going down the West Coast. For our viewers, Kaiza will be performing at the Fox Cabaret in Vancouver, a beautiful, beautiful venue. And you can find out more information by uh, at kaiza.com. Thanks, Kaiza, for yep. being on the show. We want to get you back on. I Go Dance Thank is you. a beautiful single. No wonder it hit the charts. And uh, we look forward to seeing you here in Vancouver. Closed captioning and other promotional considerations provided by Hamilton High Street Senior Residence, Richmond's newest senior living community. Well, back here once again at uh, Botanist Restaurant in the, uh, well, I'd say fairly well known, <laughs> one of yes. the best uh, hotels in this country. Uh, the Fairmont Pacific Rim. We're at the Bar Lita, and there's a reason we're wrapping the show up here. Well, yes, uh, we love cocktails, and in fact, I have to read this. They have been voted the 20, number 24 in the world's best bars in North America, and with these kind of cocktails, we can understand why. You're having what? I am having what? The flower. <laughs> <laughs> Having the paperweight, which is a gin-based drink, we want to thank Grant, the uh, very creative beverage director here. Come check out this great bar, part of Botanist Restaurant. You can do it all in one night, second floor here at the Pack Rim. Cheers. Oh, cheers, Jim. I'm Jim Gordon. And I'm Lita Leapin. We'll see you on the next edition of Our City Tonight. Don't forget to check out 10 years worth of episodes and individual interviews, all on the Our City Tonight YouTube channel. The Richmond Sentinel, providing news, entertainment, and human interest stories in print and online.